Hello and welcome to Bible Study Live with Robert Stowe UMC. My name is Pastor Jonathan Hart. We've been going through a series on the book of Joshua. This is part five and uh, we have been accelerating the pace in the first video. We only talked about chapter one as we began the story of Joshua, but to, tonight we're going to actually cover Joshua chapters 15 through 21. Uh, and then next week we will actually wrap up this study in the book of Joshua. We've been preaching sermon series uh, called Glory Days on the book of Joshua that parallels this Bible study. Um, we will be preaching our last sermon Sunday, and then like I said, our last Bible study next Wednesday night. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we are live here on our Facebook page, so I would ask that if you can, uh, if you would react to this video in some way, uh, like it, love it, and especially share it so that other people have the opportunity to join us here. Uh, thank you. I see those of you who are joining us. I'm going to take a moment to do that very thing. I've got my laptop here uh, beside the camera, so I'm going to share it on my personal Facebook timeline. And I would love it. If, I would love it if you would do the same thing again, just as a way of uh, increasing our engagement and allowing others to participate with us. If you have missed, sorry, I'm trying to multitask, and that is totally a myth. Uh, if you have missed any of the videos, either sermons or Bible studies, you can go back and, and look at any of them that you'd like to on our website, robertstowumc.com. Uh, there's a tab in the upper right that says Watch Live. Um, that's where you go and click if you want to actually watch a live video like this one right here. Uh, but also below that, you'll see all of our archived videos as well. Daily Devos that we do on weekday mornings, Bible studies on Wednesday nights, and worship lives uh, that we've been doing during this season of COVID-19. Boom, I have shared it. I hope you have too. Uh, another thing I'll say about tonight, you'll notice that the background is different than any of the other previous uh, Bible study videos, and I happen to be outside tonight. Uh, the sun is setting, so the lighting of this video may change as we go along tonight. So I ask you to forgive that in advance, uh, and we'll just make to do together. Hey, Linda. Hey, Kim. Hey, Charcy. Hey, Diane. Hey, Cindy. Hey, Joy. Hey, Wayne and Betty. And hey, Joy again. Uh, so glad to be with you. So tonight, uh, I'm obviously not going to read Joshua chapters 15 through 21, but we are going to kind of uh, summarize what they are about and talk about why, and also talk about why it's okay to speed up the pace a little bit here, especially for a Bible study and what we might get out of that. Good evening, Cindy. So in chapter 15, uh, well, let me back up for a minute. So last week, we actually covered chapters 11 through 14, and in 14... We ended with the allotment for Caleb, and that was a special story, the allotment for Caleb, because Caleb was the other guy, like Joshua, uh, in Numbers chapter 13 and 14, one of the 12, two of the 12 spies that were sent to scope out the promised land, and they came back with a favorable report. They came back full of faith and confidence in the God who they believed would give them victory in the midst of a lot of other doubt and skepticism and fear of the inhabitants of the promised land. So Joshua and Caleb were commended for their faith. Uh, they were the only two of the 12 spies who were allowed to see the promised land. Uh, Moses and all of the other Israelites of that generation um, ended their journey on this earth, their journey toward the promised land in the wilderness outside it. And the new generation, uh, their children, were the ones that entered into the promised land under the leadership of Joshua, but Caleb was also there. So, so first of all, I noticed that uh, chapter 15 begins with the allotment of Judah. And in these chapters, we see the allotments for all the other tribes of Israel. And you'll notice there's a Caleb story uh, that we talked about last week in chapter 14, verses 6 through 12. And verse 12 uh, is a concluding statement about uh, the boundaries of the territory. Then in chapter 15, it begins with Judah's allotment, but in 15 verses 13 through 19, we have another Caleb story, and it's Caleb giving a gift to his daughter, and that concludes in verse 20 uh, with another statement of boundaries of territory. So these are kind of parallel structures sandwiched in between them is the allotment to the tribe of Judah, and again, I think the, the writer of the book is just trying to emphasize Caleb's story. He's trying to get Caleb's story in here because he wants us to see that Caleb was the other faithful character. Uh, Caleb is someone to remember. Caleb is someone to model our promised land living after. Uh, we are to model his faith. We are to model the way that he took possession, literally, because that's what God told them to do beginning in chapter 1 of Joshua. He took possession in faith 
of that which the Lord gave him. And that's going to be a theme all through these chapters. So what we see in chapters 15 through 19, well, really 15 through 21, because as the Levites received their portion in 21, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, um, all of the people of God are, are receiving their lot of the promise. That was the sermon title last Sunday, uh, was your lot of the promise. And how God has a lot for each of us. And one thing we're not to do is compare our lot with someone else's. We are to receive the lot that God gives us. Uh, we are to receive the blessings. We're also to receive the challenges and face the adversities with the same faith, no matter what our lot is. Um, and not compare ourselves and, and say that we're better or worse or we wish God had given us this lot instead of the lot he gave us. Uh, but just to ask the, ask the question, how can I be strong and courageous with my lot? God, how can I model faith in you? with my lot. And some of us um, do that in different ways based on what our lot is, right? So all of these stories are about the tribes of Israel receiving their lot from the Lord. And what's interesting about this is throughout, um, you'll even see with the city of Jerusalem, which of course becomes very significant later, uh, especially when the, um, the northern and southern parts of the kingdom split later in the Old Testament, uh, but the city of Jerusalem is actually one of the areas that they don't take possession of. Um, I want to see, I thought I made a note of, where is it? Their failure to drive out the Jebusites. Yeah, chapter 15, verse 63 um, begins the story of Judah failing to drive out the Jebusites out of, out of Jerusalem. So they actually um, just kind of lived there with them. Uh, and coexisted with them, uh, which the Lord really didn't want them to do. And so there, there are also these stories of uh, members of the tribes asking for different land because they don't want to just go in and clear out the land the Lord gave them. Um, there's opposition there. And so they think, well, if we can just have part of it and then have this other part over here, maybe we can make that work. And so it's just very interesting to read what portions of the land are taken, uh, what negotiations they enter about getting different uh, parts of the land, what members are faithful to go in. I mean, Caleb was die hard, and he said, you know, if the Lord gave me this land, if anyone's in it, I'm going to go up and I'm just going to victoriously take this land because if the Lord gave it, then he will give me victory as I move into that. Isn't that a picture of how we can approach things today? And that's what I want to talk about in this Bible study video. That when we read this, this isn't just far off, uh, disconnected history, history lesson time. It's directly applicable because what we're learning from these stories is that we can either be faithful in walking into what God has for us, or we can say, nah, I'm only going to view this from a human perspective. I'm only going to view this from an earthly perspective. Um, the challenges are real. And God is great, you know, when you get into all that spiritual conversation stuff, but I live in the real world. And so I'm going to face this uh, like we, we really have to deal with it. Um, and trusting God really isn't part of the picture. And what we see from this story is when we walk faithfully, it's not that the earthly stuff's not there. And that was the rub, is that when God was promising, there were earthly realities that they had to contend with. But those who did it with the spiritual strength, courage, and faith that the Lord called them to, walked into it victoriously, were able to take possession of the fullness of the promise. Some only got to take possession of part of it because they didn't walk into it with the confidence and faith. Uh, and chapter 17 is another example of that. So the Josephites, uh, the clans of Joseph, which are divided up into Manasseh and Ephraim, um, they were complaining because of fear of the Canaanites, and in, in particular their chariots of iron. Um, and at the end of the book, little teaser, um, in Joshua's parting words, he tells them not to fear the Canaanites and their chariots of iron, that the Lord would even give them victory over the, Cana the Canaanites and their chariots of iron. So we see the allotments for the different tribes. Uh, we see in chapter 18, they gather at the sanctuary at Shiloh, which has been conquered. So they, they put a sanctuary to the Lord there. Uh, they distribute to the remaining uh, tribes there in chapter 18 and 19. All of the boundary description are, are there uh, for the remaining tribes of Judah. And that gets us all the way to chapter 20. Now, the reason we just breezed through all of that um, is is actually, as Max Licato says in his book, Glory Days, which is the book our sermon series is named after, he says, uh, in ch starting around chapter 11 or chapter 13, Joshua uh, screeches to a halt and goes from being an action-packed uh, action novel to being a land survey. 
Uh, and so it comes across as really dull reading, but what I want you to hear is all of it has meaning. And all of it goes back to the promises of the books of Numbers and Leviticus, that God is actually fulfilling these promises in the book of Joshua, and it chronicles that, and it's all driving to a specific passage that we're going to look at at the end of tonight's video. It's screaming one message loud and clear, all of it building to this one climax, this crescendo. And again, we're going to get to that at the end of tonight's video. So then something interesting happens in chapters 20 and 21. We get to these ideas of the cities of refuge and the towns for the Levites, the towns of allotment for the Levites. And the cities of refuge come after uh, the distribution to the tribes. So everybody but the tribe of the Levites gets what belongs to them. And then God stops and says, we need to have these cities of refuge. Now that points all the way back to Leviticus chapter 25, and specifically in verse 23, God says something remarkable. Excuse me. God's talking about this incredible radical concept called the year of Jubilee, which I love. If you've never heard of it, please go read it. Write this down, Leviticus 25. Go read it tonight. It's amazing. And they actually did it. It wasn't just some crazy radical idea. God said, you know, hey, the ideal culture would look like this. He said, no, this is how you're going to govern yourselves. And one thing he said in that description in the year of Jubilee, in Leviticus 25, verse 23, is you are not to permanently sell land. Land is not to be permanently sold forever because it's mine. He literally said that in those words. God said, you are not to permanently sell the land because the land is mine. And then he said, you are to live as aliens and temporary residents of the land because it belongs to me. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> How would you like for the Lord to give you this land that your, that your ancestors have been waiting on for hundreds of years, and when you finally get ready to receive it, he says, oh, by the way, uh, this isn't technically actually going to be yours. It's always going to be mine, and I'm going to share it with you, and I'm going to let you live there, but it's not actually yours. It's mine, and I want you to remember that in how you deal with it. Does he not do that? Does he not do that? Um, and the message is, that's exactly how we're still supposed to treat the gifts that God gives us today. That part of what it means to surrender your life to the Lordship and the Kingship of God, we talked about this this morning in, in today's Daily Devo. Uh, when we're going through the Lord's Prayer and we hit that line that says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If we subscribe to the kingdom of God, then as the earth tells us, the earth is his and everything in it, including all the stuff in the earth that we claim to be yours and mine. So we talk a lot about my stuff and we live in a my culture and we live in a culture where individuals have their individual stuff. But for those who follow God and claim to be his people, part of what it means to live in God's kingdom is that everything in God's kingdom, which by the way is the whole world, belongs to the king. We are stewards. And what we see from the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis 1 and 2 is that God is a giver and God is a sharer. And so he, it's his, but he freely gives and shares with us. And there's this beautiful exchange and this beautiful sharing that happens. And as such, we are to treat everything we have with a level of reverence and respect and good management and love and care as if it belonged to God himself, because it does. And that's a witness to the rest of the world of whose it really is and who really is sitting on the throne. So we're seeing all this in the book of Joshua. We're seeing this in how the people are commanded to live in the promised land, how they are to treat it. And this cities of refuge idea is fascinating to me. If you've never heard of it, uh, I'll summarize it real quick. Chapter 20 of Joshua, it's 10 verses long. The whole chapter is 10 verses long. And it is a recap of Numbers 35 verses 1 through 8 where it talks about the cities of refuge and uh, the towns set apart for the Levites which are the priests of Israel um, and other places that you can go and look up yourself. <laughs> Just type in cities of refuge or cities of asylum uh, and you can find the passages that relate to those. So the idea is that if somebody accidentally kills someone else there are cities in the promised land set apart that these, um, these, uh, sorry, I'm trying to find the right word here. 
these people who have accidentally committed manslaughter, for lack of a simpler way to put that, can flee to so that those who might seek blood vengeance can't just come in and kill them. So they come and they live in these cities of refuge and there are things that have to be said at the gate if someone comes to avenge. And so even in God's land, what God is saying is, if you just come and inappropriately encounter someone that you want to kill unjustly, maybe they, maybe they did kill someone, but it was an accident. Uh, if you just come and uh, intentionally murder them or murder their family as a way of taking your own revenge, that will be a, a spot on the reputation of God's land. That will literally be a stain upon the land when you spill that person's blood. So God's land is a land of justice and a land of mercy and a land of restraint. And again, I speak to this dilemma that many people feel when they read the Old Testament and the New, and they feel like the God of the Old Testament is different than the God of the New Testament. That the God of the New Testament is one of grace and mercy, and the God of the Old Testament is a God of justice, but he's really harsh and he's a God of wrath and judgment and all those kinds of things, that part of God's justice is restraint. Do you know why God said in the Old Testament, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth? Because he knew our propensity that when we have an eye taken, we want to take both eyes. And then when we've taken that person's both eyes, they want to come and take an arm. And then when they take an arm, we want to go back and take two arms, and it never stops. We have this escalating disproportionate response because we want to do further harm to the person who harmed us. And because God knows that this is human nature, God actually puts laws in place that says, no, the harm will stop here. Justice will be done, a price will be paid, but that's it. Uh, and it's the person who is a victim of the accidental manslaughter. It's their job to go back and to make peace with their family and to try to be an agent of restoration and reconciliation and healing after this terrible things happen. All this is in the book of Joshua. All this is in the original rules for how they are to conduct themselves in the promised land. Because again, here it is, the land really isn't theirs. The promised land was promised by God, shared by God, given by God, and even though they live on it and they enjoy the blessing of it, it's still God's. And how they conduct themselves in God's land affects God's reputation. And once again, I say that message doesn't change for us today. We have faith in God's son, Jesus. Uh, Jesus who shared the name of Joshua, that God is salvation and God saves. Uh, Jesus... Um, conquered for us the ultimate promised land, right? It's not just a, a, a geographic location here on this earth where everything is still not right. Jesus conquered the ultimate enemies for us, the enemies of sin and death. And if we are surrendered to his lordship and if we truly belong to him, then so does everything else we have. And everything we do, everything we say, how we behave in God's world affects Jesus' reputation if we call him Lord. And so these are very important things to remember as we're reading, even as we're reading the story of Joshua and the first inhabitants of the promised land, because this is what it means to be promised land people. This is what it means to live in our glory days. No unjust shedding of blood uh, in God's land, um, because revenge is mine, saith the Lord, as, as is quoted in the Old Testament. And then Paul actually quotes that in the New Testament in Romans. So then we get into towns for the Levites, and this is very interesting to me because I'm a pastor, and so <laughs> uh, I have some stock in this. Um, pastors are in some ways uh, a, a Christian, um, oh, what's the word, a Christian contemporary of what started with the Levites. Now, obviously, we don't have all the same duties. Uh, we don't go around atoning for sins, at least in the way they did, because Jesus has done that. But we do have a prophetic role among the people of God. We are supposed to have a priestly role in a way among the people of God. Now, we also believe in the priesthood of all believers that we are all called to stand in the gap and be priests for one another. Um, but there's this shepherding idea and there's this set-apartness uh, that I think is fascinating as a pastor as I read the story of the Levites. So the Levites are one of the tribes of Israel and God has promised them for a very long time that they will get no land. How do you like that? So in, in the wilderness, uh, you become Levites. You receive God's word from Mount Sinai. You receive it again at Mount Horeb in Exodus and then again in Deuteronomy. Uh, and you're reminded over and over and over, you're not getting your own land. Let me take a sip of water. That was probably good for you too, wasn't it? 
sometimes we need the pauses. Pauses are your time to think. Pauses are time for God to speak to you without me running my mouth. And sometimes I go too fast and say too much. So there's another pause. So God tells the Levites, you're not going to get your own land. Instead, I'm going to be your portion. I'm going to be your inheritance. But you are to live off the land of other people. So he's brought this up in Joshua a number of times, but he's also brought it up in other books. Again, I reference Numbers 35, verses 1 through 8, where he also talks about the cities of refuge. But he brings it up in, in Joshua, chapter 13, verse 14, chapter 13, verse 33, chapter 14, verse 4, and chapter 18, verse 7. And then he's going to bring it up again in Joshua 21, verses 2 and 3. So let me go over kind of what some of those verses say. So... Uh, in Joshua 13, 30, uh, let's, well, let's start at the very beginning, 13, 14. Uh, he says, the food offerings presented to the Lord, the God of Israel, are their inheritance, the inheritance of the Levites, as he promised them. So there it says that, that they're going to receive food offerings, and that's their inheritance. But then in verse 33 of chapter 13, same chapter, it says, the Lord, the God of Israel, is their inheritance as he promised them. So the Lord himself is their inheritance. Then in chapter 14, verse 4, we see the most um, clear parallel with chapter 21, and that is that the Levites will receive towns to live in from the other tribes of Israel and pasture lands for their livestock. That's more of what chapter 21 details uh, them receiving. In chapter 18, verse 7, it says the priestly service of the Lord is their inheritance the inheritance of the Levites. And then in chapter 21, verses 2 through 3, it says, The Lord commanded through Moses that you give us towns to live in with pasture lands for our livestock. And that's the Levites actually coming to the assembly, led by Joshua, and like Caleb, saying, This is what the Lord promised us. We want what's ours. We want what we were promised. We want what the Lord said is ours, no more, no less. And so they come and they receive their inheritance from the Lord. And here's what sticks out about this to me. Um, the towns for the Levites, the, the Levites portion, so to speak. It's like, this is, this is what hit me for the first time, I think, this week. The Levites themselves, as a people, were like the tithe. Have you heard of the tithe? Um, if, you're, if, you're a member of the, if you're a member of any church, you probably know what a tithe is, right? Because your pastor has probably uh, asked you over and over to not forget about your tithe. And the tithe, we get this from... Uh, the early days of the story of Abraham, when God is first promising that there will be a people of God at all, and the first acts of worship are happening that we see recorded among the people of God, and a tenth of all of his wealth, he, he sees his wealth as the blessing of God, so he takes a tenth of it, and he brings that as an offering to the Lord. Um, when it's animals, they bring the, the, the youngest, uh, without blemish, you know, depending on the offering, they bring the first and best of their harvest when they're raising crops. Uh, they bring the first fruits, um, the first tenth and the best of what they have. And, and when you give a tenth, what it's a reminder of is that the other 90% also belongs to the Lord. So the Levites as a tribe, their whole tribe was a reminder to the people that they were the Lord's because the Levites were not their own and the Levites land was not their own. So the Levites were not possessors of land, they were users of the land. They got their land from the other tribes. So you can read about that in Joshua 21. Each tribe came and gave a portion of their land to the Levites. Um, some of them were cities of refuge and that also was intriguing to me, this idea that you've got priests living in the cities of refuge where other people would come who have committed accidental manslaughter. There's something sacred about that. Um, so the Levites uh, were like a tie. They were a portion of the people that reminded the rest of the people that the Lord was their real inheritance, not the land. And even the land that they did have belonged to the Lord. The Lord is the giver of everything else, land, livestock, produce, prosperity, provision, um, that they were not possessors, they were users. They were stewards of what the Lord had given them. This reminds us of the truth of Psalm 16, verse 5, which again we just talked about in the sermon last Sunday. Um, we talked about the part of the verse that says, 
Um, the boundary lines has, have fallen for me in pleasant places. My lot is secure, right? Uh, but Psalm 16, 5 is also the verse that says, the Lord is my portion. The Lord is my portion. And that wasn't just true for the Levites. That's supposed to be true. I mean, the psalmist wrote that so that anyone among the people of God could be able to say that as, as a statement and a declaration of worship. The Lord is my portion. And we still say that today. And that this is what we mean by that that the Lord is my portion. I don't need all this other stuff to be, my, to be my blessing, to be my security. He is my blessing, He is my security, and that's why I get to enjoy every other good thing I have because I received it from His hand. And so the theme here is about receiving, uh, or to use the language of the book of Joshua, taking possession of that which the Lord gave us and never forgetting that He is the giver. So, <clears throat> Let's see here. There were some verses. Mm, no, I don't want to go there quite yet. Okay, then I'm, I'm going to go ahead and skip to chapter 21, verses 43 through 45. So thank you for sticking with us. It's been about 25 minutes, and I believe I said at the beginning of this video that there was one key passage we were going to get to at the end that explains why all of these chapters and chapters of land survey matter and are important. And here it is. I'm going to actually read this. We're going to read this together. So if you want to turn to Joshua chapter 21, verses 43 through 45, we read this on Sunday, but we're going to read it again. Uh, if you're in a browser and you want to open up a, a tab and Google this, Joshua 21, verses 43 through 45, you know what? I'm going to challenge you to do something. Uh, you don't have to do this. This is just a challenge for those who want to accept it. I'm going to ask you to travel with these verses for the next two weeks. I'm going to challenge you right now that if you want to get a scrap piece of paper or an index card, if you're the kind of person that highlights your Bible, thank you, Wes, for putting that in the comments. Joshua 21, verses 43 through 45. That's the verse. It's in the comments if you want to go down and find it. Write that down. And uh, one thing I like to do when I'm memorizing Scripture is I like to write the verse in my own hand multiple times. I write it, and, and I don't just read it. I write it. I read it. I say it aloud and I write it. I do all three of those things as a way of hearing myself proclaim the verse so that it kind of gets into me and becomes uh, part, part, part of me. Um, Wes told me you're welcome. That's very kind, Wes. He's so polite. <laughs> so write these verses down. I would challenge you. And uh, if you're not the kind of person who feels like you can memorize, that's fine. Put it on your fridge. Put it on your bathroom mirror. Stick it in your car. Put it somewhere as a reminder so that this can get into your soul and you can travel with this for 14 days. Here it is. So the Lord gave Israel all the land he had sworn to give their ancestors, and they took possession of it and settled there. The Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their ancestors. Not one of their enemies withstood them. The Lord gave all their enemies into their hands. Not one of all the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Every one was fulfilled. This is probably the theme passage of the entire book of Joshua. It is certainly the climax that we've been crescendoing to since about chapter 11, 12, or 13 when we really get into the distribution of the land. Why does it matter? Why do we need to know every place with every boundary line given to every family of every tribe? It matters because every one of them is an exclamation point on this statement. God is faithful. God keeps his promises. Every one of them, every one of them, every one of them. And what's interesting about these verses to me is, uh, of course, it references back that God made this promise to their ancestors. It wasn't even to them. Uh, they weren't around when God made, made these promises. There's a message for us today. It was their job to take possession of what God promised their ancestors. There's a message for us today. The Lord gave them rest on every side because they took possession. There's a message for us today, just as he had sworn to their ancestors. And then it says that one of their enemies withstood them. And that's interesting to me because all throughout chapters 15 through 20, uh, 19, we see stories of certain Israelites not driving out certain peoples. 
there were certain people that they chose not to drive out. They went in the land, and some of them just kind of skirted around them. Others of them chose to kind of live on the land with them, but not drive them out. And what it's saying is um, the people chose not to drive out certain peoples, but God gave them victory every time they moved in to take possession of his promise in strength and courage and faith. So it wasn't God's failure that the people didn't move into certain lands and conquer certain peoples. It was the people's failure to have the strength and courage that the book of Joshua has been challenging us to walk in since chapter 1. Six times in the first chapter, right, if I remember correctly? Do you remember? Correct me if I'm wrong, please. Show me that, show me that we've been learning together. Uh, six or seven, I think it's six. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. So the point is, God is faithful. Even when people are not, God is faithful. Um, of the enemies that they chose to challenge and come up against and believe that God would give them victory, God gave them into their hands. And I think the same is true with us. I, I think the only difference in the number of giants that we can slay um, is in the giants we're willing to take on in faith in the Lord, right? And I'm not saying we don't do, go through bad things. Don't hear me say that. I'm not saying that... <clears throat> Sometimes we walk in faith and courage and it still doesn't go the way we want or have a happy ending the way we want. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying when we walk in faith, God honors that and God blesses and God never lets us down. He doesn't always do what we think He should. He doesn't always answer the way we want. Not everything has the happy ending that we want. Uh, but God is our portion and there's something to that. Um, it's not the land. It's not the produce. It's not the job. Uh, it's not the family dynamics that maybe we wish would change, and it's God's fault. Why, why aren't they different than the way they are? I'm doing everything I can to promote change. Um, God is not failing there. There's more going on. Our job is to put our strength and courage and, and faith in Him. Uh, put our faith in Him and walk in strength and courage. There we go. So, uh, God fulfills all His promises. So I guess to wrap all this up, uh, what I would say is that promised land people know and live as if what they have is really the Lord's, right? Is that what you've heard tonight? Uh, God promised, God gave, it's His, He shares. God promised, God gave, it's still His, He's a really good sharer. Uh, and so we're to live as those who have received from the Lord. One last thing, and this is kind of a nerd thing, uh, as I was studying, there's, there's really one commentary I've been using more than any other commentary, um, and if you're into commentaries, it's, it's part of a series that I really like called the New International Commentary on the Old Testament, and there's a New International Commentary on the New Testament, and I believe Woodstra is the last name of this uh, scholar, and on page 310 of his commentary, he points out the fact that without taking note of the faith perspective or the lack of it, one can't do justice to the biblical text of the book of Joshua and interpret it for its true meaning. It is all about whether the people have faith in God's promises or not. Um, that's, 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 that's the whole thing. So as we, as we come to the end, next week we're going to look at Joshua's farewell. Uh, we're going to look at his finishing strong as a leader. We're actually going to look at his death. If you didn't see that coming, I'm sorry. It's called the book of Joshua. So we started at the beginning of his leadership as he was raised up by God to take over for Moses, the greatest leader Israel had ever known at that point, the only leader Israel had really, really ever had at that point, the first and only person who had really spoken on behalf of God up to that point. Um, that's where we began in the book of Joshua, Joshua taking that mantle. And next week, we're actually going to look at Joshua's final days and where the book leaves off uh, and prepares the way for the next season in the life of Israel, which ends up being the judges, which is, uh, then goes into the time of the kings and the prophets and, and all that. So this has been a wonderful journey. Uh, if you have any questions or comments from tonight, even after we stop this video and it's no longer live, please continue the conversation. I didn't really stop to ask for comments and questions during the video. Thank you for those who have shared. I see your comments and I appreciate them. Um, I would love to engage with you. So especially if there's something that impacted you, uh, if there's a key takeaway, and it doesn't just have to be from tonight. You know, we've been at this for five sessions now. If there's something that you want to share that's really stuck out to you or a question or something you're confused about, 
please share that so we can all continue to learn and grow and dialogue together. This has been a great way to spend time growing in our faith, studying scripture, uh, and giving time to one another in the Lord as we seek to grow in our relationship with Him. So thank you for joining us. We'll see you again tomorrow for Daily Devo. We'll see you Sunday for Worship Live uh, as we finish out this series on Joshua. And then next Wednesday, we'll have our final Bible study in the book of Joshua. God bless you tonight. This is Pastor Jonathan wishing you grace and peace.